Hello, and welcome to Gaspar's History Podcast. This is Gaspar, and I'm continuing the Meat Hound series with Episode 10, Uncle Bill. Today's story takes us into mid-February 1943 and will end on a mission that has very personal impact on the 423rd Bomb Squadron and Steel. The 8th Air Force is getting bigger, with planes and crews arriving every day. In fact, our star of the show, Meat Hound, is less than a month away from arriving in Thurley. The mission frequency is also increasing, and the demands for maximum effort are growing. The bomb squadron surgeons continue to complain about combat fatigue, and the young pilots and crews who have not been here long are showing the effects of stress. With that, let's jump into our story. It was bitter cold, and what was worse, the elite U.S. soldiers did not have proper winter combat gear. The U.S. soldiers crawled out of shelters and moved slowly towards their point of assault. They were going to make an attack today, and they had already been up for hours. Each soldier moved very slowly, calculating their path through the shadows, because one wrong move and they would be spotted, and that meant the Germans would start pounding them with mortar and artillery fire. The replacement sergeant had a look in his eyes, and my friend Bud could tell the sergeant was scared, even though he was trying not to show it. As Bud cautiously moved forward, he thought to himself, he had never seen so many dead bodies. It was really quite horrific. The only comfort was that the bitter cold was keeping the gut-riching stench suppressed. Dawn started to break, and the U.S. soldiers who had already fought their way through Vosnak and Germiter were at their point of assault. When the mortar and artillery fire started to rain down on them, it was time to go. An experienced lieutenant who earned his rank through battlefield commissions looked to the private on his left, and he told the soldier, Stay in my hip pocket and move with me. He turned to the private on his right and he said, Stay in my hip pocket and under no circumstances are you to go looking for your brother. Do you understand me? It was time to attack and the two companies of unholy bastards came out of their cover with a possession in their eyes, an unholy look to be sure. And after 15 yards of hard running, they felt exhausted because their adrenaline had been up since very early in the morning, and now it was in overdrive. The lieutenant yelled, Come on! And the two privates followed him up and into the field. They took two steps forward when the private on the lieutenant's left was felled by a machine gun through the heart. He never knew what hit him, and the last thing he heard was, Come on! Forty-five years later, the lieutenant and I paid homage to this young man, who was buried at the time, at the American Cemetery in Belgium. As we stood by his grave and took pictures, the lieutenant asked me to find the family of this young man and tell them what had happened to him. He said that after the war he tried to make contact with them, but he was unable to find any of his relatives, and the only thing that he knew was that he was from Utah and that he was a Mormon. After that trip, I spent years looking for this young man's family in a world without the internet. I eventually gave up looking. Then, after the lieutenant passed away, I knew I still had a debt to pay, so I started looking again. This time, my search, aided by new technology, offered me up a county in Utah from the Department of Graves Registration. I looked up the county's local newspaper, and I wrote my story to the newspaper editor who printed it. I was flooded with family members of this young man. I was able to bundle my information with framed photos and sent them to the family. The parents of the fallen lad never knew what happened to their son and never even knew where he was buried, and they went to their graves wondering. Why do I share this story of the Rangers at Hill 400 with you? Because in my recent conversation with the Robert Malin family, one of the pilots in the Meat Hound series, We talked about how the Malins have correspondence between aircrew families as they tried to get answers to what may have happened to their children. Were they dead 
or alive, and is there any idea where they might be? It really is quite tragic to think of what the parents of the greatest generation had to endure. The crew of the Unbearable were feeling lucky today. They had made it out of Germany with three engines, and they had been relatively unharassed over the channel. The Unbearable had made a safe landing in Bungay, and the crew had made some new friends. They were introduced to the crews of the 329th Bomb Squadron, 93rd Bomb Group, who were hospitable and accommodating. The Unbearable needed a new engine and some oil lines, so they were going to be in Bungay at least overnight. The Unbearable was not the first aircraft to make an emergency landing at Bungay, and the 329th was getting used to it. Being just over the coast, it was an ideal spot to land in a pinch. Unbearable's hosts were part of the heavy bomb group squadron flying consolidated B-24 Liberators and doing a really nice job of hunting submarines and harassing the German coastal radar stations. Steele was feeling pretty comfortable. He had the security and familiarity of Hamilton, Hull, Piotrowski, Bamforth, and Smoot to keep him company. The crew of the Unbearable penciled out their after-action report and would have it to record when they returned to Thurley, which they were hoping would not take too long. Their host had a Nissan hut for them to stay in, and they were offered warm food, coffee, and those lovely Vita Field mugs. Later that night, Jones and Steele toasted Hamilton and congratulated him for completing his first mission. Orman was thinking to himself, everything happened so fast. It was like a blur. A tour of duty felt like an eternity away, and the navigator with his fancy Ray-Bans was trying not to dwell on the journey ahead. Unbearable's engineer, Tech Sergeant Leon Bamforth, knew that changing the right inner B-17F right R-182097 Cyclone engine was pretty standard routine, easier than saying it, especially for the experienced ground crews. But he wanted to help where he could. He knew that the engine change with a full complement of mechanics took about as long as driving from Brunswick, Maine to New York City, but rarely was any unit in the Eastern Theater of Operations at full staff, so he wanted to ensure that it was not going to take a couple of days to finish the repairs. The right inner engine was an original engine for the unbearable, factory installed, and it had over 200 hours of flying time logged on her. Tech Sergeant Leon Leroy Bamforth was born in 1920 and was 22 years old when the crew made the emergency landing in Bungay. He was from Cumberland County, Maine, and is a young man who we are familiar with in our adventure. He had trained with Steele and his crew in the United States and had arrived with the team on December 11, 1942. Bamforth had graduated from Brunswick, Maine High School in 1938, and his father, Carol, ran an automotive parts store and garage. This obviously led to Leon's interest in motors and engines. Now, he was helping to replace an engine that he had never heard of just a couple of years ago. Leon was also a graduate of Spartan Aeronautics School in June of 1942, and then he was attached to David Steele's crew, destined for Europe, in the 423rd Bomb Squadron. There's another interesting anecdote about Steele's crew, and that is both Orman Hamilton and Leon Bamforth are from Brunswick's. The repairs on the Unbearable progressed nicely, and after a very quick flight on February 5th, the Unbearable and her crew arrived back in Thurley to their friendly confines and welcoming friends. Stories were shared and the after-action reports were discussed, but then the best news of all had come. An air wing holiday was announced for February 6th. Welcome news indeed. A day off. Steele, Hamilton, and let's not forget fellow pilot Bart Wigington could not think of a better gift. The boys on the base were certainly going to cut loose, and since the entire air wing was getting the day off, well, God help those small English towns. A day off. It really was a pleasant surprise, and Dr. Schiller agreed. He could not think of a better gift. Dr. Schiller knew how hard the lads had been driven since Christmas. Even if it were one day off, it was a big deal and felt good. A day to do what you wanted. No raids, no practice, 
no classes, no nothing. There was a good bit of celebrating the night of the 5th, which resulted in a lot of sleep-ins on the 6th. But again, that's what the boys needed. Now, they could get up late and head into town and still be back by night. The days meandered by, and it was quiet for the next week. No raids, no missions, just routine. The routine was broken up by some exciting news. Word through the camp was that Lieutenant Geis and Sergeant Wisenbach were confirmed to be in the French underground, and they were making their way back to England. As usual, due to all the secrecy, there simply was not a lot of details, but it gave the boys hope. How many others that had gone down were also in the underground and making their way out? I never really thought about this before I started this podcast, but the active pilots and crews were told very little of the underground in case they themselves were shot down and captured. They simply then would not have any relevant information to disclose to the Nazis in an interrogation. We are also starting to come to terms with the chances of making 25 missions is pretty thin. The Evade reports that I read, which are written after the Evade makes it back to England, disclose very little information, again, for good reason, as the Germans had eyes and ears all through England. It was February 13th. Steele and Hamilton got up, dressed, ate breakfast, and attended their usual briefings and education sessions. What are you wearing tonight? Orman jested to Steele. What do you mean, what am I wearing? I'm wearing the only thing I have. Steele could see the smile on Hamilton's face. Forget it. The 423rd Bomb Squadron was lucky enough to have a Valentine's Day party, and once again the boys were going to cut it loose. The planning committee had organized quite the shindig, but most importantly, a broad invitation went out to the Army Nurses Corps, and the ladies showed up in force. From Oxford to Diddington, the ladies liked to dance. Steele walked into the club, and the music was already playing, and the dance floor was filled with dancers. He grabbed a drink and was thinking, take it easy, we're going to be flying tomorrow. He sat down with his friend Chris and enjoyed surveying the room. The song ended, the band said a few words, the usual, and then they started playing a jitterbug. An attractive brunette walked onto the dance floor, and she started dancing, which caught Steele's eye. The fact was, she caught a lot of eyes, including Chris's. David, David, hey, said Orman Hamilton. Steele snapped out of his daze. Are you okay? Yeah, fine. Just thinking about Avon Park. The band had started up a jitterbug, and Steele's memory went back to the night he met B. Groover at the Blue Anchor in Avon Park. Funny how music can take you back to your memories. Hell, it was barely six months ago, so I guess he was not remembering too far back, unless we take into account how Dr. Schiller says the boys have aged ten years in six months. B and David would date while he was in Sebring and Avon Park, but no long-term commitments were made and no long-term commitments were discussed. The fact was B made it very clear she was not interested in being a widow, so call me when you get out. Steele was thinking back on better times, knowing he had another mission to fly the next day. It was a good night, even if the memories make you miss home but it also helps one to focus on the most important things in life and gives one a vision, a mission of sorts. A lot of the young men of the 423rd Squadron partied a little too hard that night, and the reveille for the next raid came way too early. Valentine's Day. Nothing like getting to fly a mission on Valentine's Day. For the boys from Chicago, a raid on this day was a bad omen. The morning schedule was pretty Groundhog Day, and the prize today was the marshalling yards at Ham. It was a prize that even though it had been selected as the primary target for several missions, an actual raid on Ham continued to elude the 8th Air Force and the 306 Bomb Group. Steele enjoyed the party last night, watching the dancing and the memories that came with it. He did not have too much to drink knowing that he was flying this morning. A raid on Ham worried him a bit, and he wondered if part of the reason the group had not made it to Ham was maybe due to a higher power intervening, and when they do make it to Ham, he wondered how bad was it going to be. Jones and Steele mounted up 
went through the checklist and got the four right cyclone engines humming. Jones mentioned the weather did not look good, but thought maybe Germany would be better. The 306 bomb group took off at 0820. They circled thoroughly at 3,000 feet, then headed for Cromer and 19,000 feet, and then they were off to the German coastline. They had 20 aircraft on the raid today, and they were flying two squadrons of seven in V's echelon right and one squadron of six in V's echelon left. The cloud cover was very bad, visibility was poor, and it was making everyone nervous. When the bomb group got over the English Channel, the bomb pins were pulled and the machine guns were tested. And today, all of the guns were in working order except for one, which had a belt feed jam. It was not too long before two of the aircraft became separated from the group. They were then forced to turn back. The perils of the poor visibility and cloud cover were evident. Tech Sergeant Stymax, the radio operator, was monitoring the radio and the group was again under strict radio silence protocol. And he was thinking of his friend, the mad Russian, Mike Roscovich, and his 100-pound Blue Devil practice bomb that he was hoping to drop on the Krauts. You see, Sergeant Roscovich was a character, and besides cutting ties off of generals, he liked to carry practice bombs on the aircraft so that he could drop them out the bomb bay doors knowing some square head would have to spend time trying to defuse it. I use the word practice bombs due to a complaint I received from the Ordnance Department when I used the word dummy bomb. I was told dummy bomb was not politically correct and I needed to use practice bomb so not to offend all of the dummy bombs out there. In the future, I will try to use practice bombs instead. Roski, as he was known, was also an avid photographer, and he would carry a camera with him and take pictures on the mission. Let's just say there were some times that his fellow crew members were wishing he was manning his gun and not trying to take a picture. Even after nearly two and a half hours of flying, the cloud cover continued to be problematic and there was no sign of land. That's when Tech Sergeant Stymax reported to Jones that the mission was aborted and all aircraft were ordered back home. Then, like clockwork, the Nazi guns started to fill the air with flak. It was not too bad, meaning it was not too intense and it was not that accurate. Jones followed the squadron into a right bank. Steel was not dealing with any engine or mechanical issues, so it was a pretty smooth flight. The gunners were a little relaxed, but Jones urged them to be vigilant as the Hun could come out of the clouds at any time. Sergeant Hull and Lieutenant Hamilton looked at each other and commented, yeah, they could, but we can barely see the plane next to us. Tech Sergeant Bamforth from his top gun engineer position, he kept spinning the wheel, and he was the most vigilant. First Lieutenant Kelly Ross had the honor of piloting 41 24488 Banshee today, the first over Germany plane, or at least one of them. It was his first mission since joining the squadron in December. It was a hard day to fly due to the lack of visibility, so that was contributing to his nerves. A little after 1100 hours, three Luftwaffe aircraft came peeking out of the clouds. You could hear Jones, two planes over, I told you so. But these fighters were I and the Banshee, and her echelon. Two of the aircraft were ME-109s and the third a twin-engine ME-210. They were flying level at 7 o'clock but maintaining a good distance. The Banshee were on high alert with a few eyes fixed on the known threats and a few eyes looking for new ones. Then the most interesting thing occurred. One of the ME-109s pulled out of formation and ran up to 10 o'clock and started an acrobatic show. Maybe we would equate that to taunting in today's sports vernacular, or maybe he was just warming up for what was about to come and he wanted to have a good feel for the aircraft. Either way, he then banked right, dove, and came immediately back up for an attack from below. Navigator Lieutenant Owen from his left nose gun fired two bursts, one short and one long, that pierced the fuselage of the ME-109. 
the Luftwaffe pilot returned fire and sent a 20 millimeter cannon shell into the number three engine, severing the oil line and crippling the engine. The ME-109 flew past the Banshee as Lieutenant Kelly Ross started to assess the damage. Sergeant Harris from his right waist gun picked up the Luftwaffe acrobat on the right side as he pulled up to wing over for another pass. And when, in his stall, Sergeant Harris connected with the most accurate of gunfire, which was seen entering the cockpit area. And then the acrobat rolled over and dove for the sea, never to be seen again. This lone attack by the Luftwaffe pilot actually qualified the squadron for a mission count, and that was a welcome count by each of the crews. The Banshee and the rest of the squadron made it back to Thurley with no other incidents. Steele and his crew had another tick mark on their counter, so it was quite a nice Valentine's Day indeed. On February 15th, as the crews nestled in for a non-flying day, orders were received of a leadership shakeup for the bomb group. Colonel Frank Armstrong got his stars. He was now a brigadier general and passed the 306 bomb group over to Lieutenant Colonel Claude Putnam. The executive officer position was then filled by Major Wilson from the 423rd Squadron, and the 423rd's new leader was Captain John Lambert. Colonel Armstrong's tenure was short but productive. The 306 had seen improved results, and he had led them to Germany, even if he was not the first to cross the line. His discipline was key, and he left the Flyers feeling better than when he had arrived. Steele would comment years later, Armstrong was used as a leadership mold for the movie 12 O'Clock High. February 16th brought a new day that would change the 423rd Bomb Squadron forever. There was going to be a big raid today. The group would go back to see their old friend at St. Nazaire. Their primary target was the submarine pin locks on the southwest corner of the complex. The last trip to St. Nazaire on January 3rd did not go well. The groans throughout the mission room were exaggerated. Lieutenant Colonel Putnam, the new leader, would be at the tip of the spear, and the crews were hoping he would have the same luck as Armstrong. But then again, Armstrong never flew to see their old friend at St. Nazaire. Dare we say Germany was an easier raid? As soon as the target was announced, it made Steele's mind race back to his first mission to St. Nazaire. In his mind's eye, he could see the heavy, accurate flak, like one solid sheet of black ice, a hole in the right wing, and the disintegration of the Cayley in front of them. But the unbearable was able to hold on that day and make it home, five days later, of course. Lieutenant Ralph Jones was next to Steele, and this time he did not have to try to hide his emotions. He and Steele had already made this trip, and he knew that they could do it again. I mean, they did bring back a cripple from Germany. So what is a little St. Nazaire flak? Let's be honest, that is bravado, because they knew exactly what St. Nazaire flak was, and if they never saw it again, it would be too soon. Lieutenant Jones knew what St. Nazaire meant, and that they were going to take a dose of flak, so hopefully it misses all of the vital organs. The bomb group would fly a similar formation as Valentine's Day, with the lead squadron of seven in V's led by Lieutenant Colonel Putnam, and then the second squadron of seven in V's echelon right. The third squadron, the 423rd, would be flying six planes in V echelon left, and they would have the low position in the group. Typically, the 423rd had found themselves on the right of the formation, but today they were on the left. It's not good to mix things up if one is superstitious. Lieutenant Uncle Bill Warner, the 28-year-old old man of the 423rd Squadron, was up for his captaincy, which should be announced any day now. Everyone knew it would be approved, and there was no one who did not think that he didn't deserve it. He was a very popular and respected leader and friend. Lieutenant Warner was leading the second element of the 3rd Squadron on the left wing of the formation. His crew was flying their usual 42-5717, a no-name deaf beauty. Uncle Bill was a great nickname because he was like your favorite uncle. 
I want to make sure that all my nieces and nephews out there heard that. He was like your favorite uncle. Lieutenant Warner had started flying with 2nd Lieutenant Arnold Carlson as his co-pilot after Steele and his crew had arrived. In fact, Steele has not flown with his co-pilot Carlson since they arrived in England. Warner was a polite, welcoming young man and a very good teacher. His crew, even with replacements, worked like a well-oiled machine. Warner's infectious smile put you at ease, and you always felt like you were part of the family. Not only was he old for the job, but he was technically too tall to be a pilot, standing six feet four inches in height. He had a hard time sitting in the pilot's seat, and if anything ever happened, he would have a hard time getting out of the aircraft at least with any urgency. Steele liked having Warner and Carlson in front of him. There was a comfort in it. There was a lot to be said being led by a good pilot and crew. Now that they were being placed on the left wing, Jones and Steele would find themselves at the furthest point on the left of the bomb group today. Usually flying the number three on the right wing provides some cover from, typically, Lieutenants George and Malin, but they are not flying today and the positions are flipped. Thinking through this, Steele also realized they were flying Lieutenant George and Malin's aircraft, or at least the one they had been flying, 425171, another no-named F beauty. The bombardier toggler, Staff Sergeant William Hull, was going to be ecstatic because he was going to pick up twin Browning 50 caliber machine guns, which he had not had the pleasure to use yet. Steele was wondering if that would at least put a smile on Sergeant Hull's face because he was the most unsmiling guy he had ever met. Instead of Lieutenants George and Malin, the second slot was being flown by Captain Robert Smith with Lieutenant Lewis P. Johnson, another good pilot and crew, so Steele could not ask for a better group of boys to fly through hell with. Let me assure you, St. Nazaire was like flying through hell. Captain Smith was flying the infamous Sutton Bridge life raft crash plane, a plane with a second life. The lead element of the 423rd had Captain Maurice Salada with Lieutenant Roy Kelly flying the first aircraft Steele and Warner flew in together, the 425180 DFC. Lieutenant Check and Lieutenant Bart Wigington were in the number two, flying a no-name deaf beauty, 425720. Lieutenant Wigington had arrived with Steele in December, and they had made a strong friendship. Wigington was the most personable kid you would ever want to meet, so it was hard not to be his friend. Lastly, Lieutenant Yuri with Lieutenant Hopkins were in the number three slot, flying Old Faithful with the mad Russian, Roski, with his camera and the training bomb, by his side. The first waypoint was Celsi Bill, which other than Beachy Head has to be the best waypoint if we're ranking them, of course. The bomb group was climbing to 19,000 feet. Orman Hamilton was now navigating the crew to Carentan, France, which in just over a year during the Normandy campaign will see the 101st Airborne and one of Steele's relatives trying to evict the current non French occupants. Staff Sergeant William Hull was in the nose with Worman, and besides having toggler responsibilities, he had a nice set of Browning 50 caliber machine guns that had been jury rigged into 425171 since she had arrived in late November of 1942. Staff Sergeant Smoot, in his Tennessee accent, was the rearview mirror. He was on the interphone, Captain. There's an explosion in one of the bomb groups behind us. The raid today had gotten off to a bad start. There was a mid-air collision between two B-24s and the 44th Bomb Group. Later, it would be documented that the snafu, unfortunately named, had a mechanical issue that dropped her altitude and caused her pilot, Lieutenant Billings, to drift. When she did, the Texan II, piloted by Lieutenant Long, tried to evade and the planes collided, causing a mid-air explosion that disintegrated both aircraft and killed all the crews. The 425171 crew had their heads on a swivel as they climbed through the English Channel. Where are those damn spitfires, Jones wondered. 
I have to tell you all, in reading mission reports, this is Jones's favorite complaint. And again today, he is wondering, where is the fighter escort? The mid-air collision in the 44th Bomb Group is also a reminder of just how perilous the close formation flying really was. The no-named F beauty climbed towards 22,500 feet as they approached Mont Saint-Michel, and they would be a thousand feet under the lead squadron. The crew could see the monastery well, but had to chalk up another attraction like the Eiffel Tower that was seen but not visited. Staff Sergeant Walter Piotrowski could chime in as his interphone was working so far, but it would be in and out all day. Tech Sergeant Leon Bamforth was the top turret gunner and engineer, a real comfort for the crew. Staff Sergeant James Smoot was in his common tail gunner position and was reporting to the pilots what he saw, providing them with a rear view mirror. That leaves the two newbies on the crew today, both manning the waist gun positions. Tech Sergeant Charles Sheffield from South Carolina had come in with a crew that arrived on January 16th, and he was immediately sent out for additional training. Then there was Sergeant Abraham Cogen, who was a radio man from New York, but today he was a gunner. Just when you think you have things figured out, you realize you don't. In December, when the Spitfire escorts turned over the bombers to their own accord at the French coast, the Luftwaffe had been there to greet them, and it would make the crews hot that the Luftwaffe knew when and where they would be. On this day, the Spitfire escorts were nowhere to be found, and the bomb group had crossed over into France and had passed the Cherbourg Peninsula and was heading into southwest France and still not a bogey to be seen. Now note, my comment is related to the 306 bomb group as the other bomb groups may have encountered, most likely, some Luftwaffe fighters. It made the crews nervous and it built up their anxiety like the twisting of a rubber band. It is also important to note that the flak along the coast and into France had been relatively light and sporadic as the crews don't really mention it as a concern. It was also common practice to navigate around large flat concentrations, and today, that navigation was working. The 306 bomb group headed for Saint-Nazaire without enemy fighter or flak incidents, but they lost two aircraft due to a communications issue and a sick crew member. So the 306 was in pretty good shape and in formation with 18 aircraft. St. Nazaire continued to be a key base for the Nazi Navy and their wolf packs. The 8th Air Force bombing raids had started to accumulate damage, but the submarine pens were still operational, so the bomb groups were being sent back again and again until the job was done, which reminds me of an analogy of beating one's head against a wall and expecting a different outcome. The good news was, the Allies were starting to get a noose around the Nazis' neck in the battle for the Atlantic and were slowly choking them out. Staff Sergeant James Smoot was in his usual tail gun position, even though he had spent some time at the waste guns also. He could see the following bomb groups who were in close order, the 91st, 305th, 303rd, and 44th, primarily B-17s, but a little further back were the B-24 Liberators. 59 B-17s and 6 B-24s were going to make it to the bomb run, and the whole air wing was within three minutes of each other. So when the bomb started to fall, 160 tons of ordnance would fall in a three-minute period. The Memphis Bell was somewhere out there, but she was unknown to the 423rd Squadron, so she was just another aircraft and crew of 10. On the other side of the squadron, in a little higher altitude, were Lieutenants Hennessy and Little John in 4124560, back in their primary aircraft, Little Audrey. Little Audrey was holding the right flank of the squadron, while Staff Sergeant James Smoot and the rest of Jones's crew was holding the left flank. The 306 bomb group was still not being harassed from the Luftwaffe. There are reports that other bomb groups were under attack, and at least one B-17 was going down as they made their way into German-occupied France. The 306 was getting closer to Saint-Nazaire. They were approaching Pont Vaughan, France, and will bank left, open bomb bay doors, and head for the submarine pens. 
They were at high altitude, but the pens made for a good target with their 480,000 cubic meters of reinforced steel and a rooftop of anti-aircraft batteries. The target was some 300 meters long, but they were technically trying to knock out the locks, which would require a little more precise bombing. Jones and Steele and the rest of the crews knew they were going to take a beating today because no plane had ever left St. Nazaire without holes, and everyone knew the Luftwaffe flat crews were experts. The 306 bomb group reached Pont-Vent, France, Waypoint, and they banked left. They were five minutes out, Bombay doors open, nerves were high since everyone knew what was coming. One of the objectives of the Allied Air War strategy was to hit the Luftwaffe daily and ground them out in a war of attrition. But let's be cognizant of the fact that attrition was clearly with the objective to totally annihilate them and force them into unconditional surrender. In today's mission, we are lucky enough to have some of the German Luftwaffe records available for us uh, for review. So I will insert some of the names and pilots uh, and information that came out of the Luftwaffe about today's battle. It was an early morning for Lieutenant Otto Stomberger, who went by Stato, in his ninth Staffel, which was part of JG-26. Lieutenant Stato had been with the ninth Staffel JG-26 since February of 1941 and had shot down his first enemy aircraft during the Dieppe invasion. The Luftwaffe radar stations had picked up the bomb groups and the Nazis held off on sending planes into the air until the 11 Spitfire squadrons had turned back. Jones and Steele again commented, What Spitfire escorts? We saw none. They were not alone, as Lieutenant Walter Smiley in 4124466, a no-named deaf beauty, an unbearable sister, wanted to know the same thing. I am now going to apologize because I know I am going to butcher the German names and, and descriptions um, in the German language and, and vernacular. So I will, uh, again, apologize and do try to do the best that I can. So now it was time to get airborne, and the 12 aircraft in the 9th Staffel were launched and gaining altitude to meet the bombers. Feldwebel Franz Dorr and Uter officer Eric Schwartz were with Lieutenant Stato this day in their Focke Wolf 190s. Their strategy today was to let the flat gunners of St. Nazaire do their damage, then meet the bombers on the way out and harass them to the coast. They planned on attacking the nose from 12 o'clock high. Colonel Putnam and Captain Mac McKay in 24514, a no-name deaf beauty, were leading the bomb group through the bomb run. Everything is so peaceful before the storm. Let's spend a few moments reviewing the 423rd Squadron and their planes and crews as they approach Flack Alley. The 423rd Squadron was led by Captain Salada and Lieutenant Kelly in the DFC. Lieutenants Check and Bart Wigington, and remember Bart had come in with Steele and his crew uh, in December. Lieutenant Check, though, uh, he was a veteran of the group from Minot, North Dakota, he was 25 years old and an excellent pilot. They were in the number two slot flying a no-name deaf beauty. And then there was Lieutenant Urey with Lieutenant Hopkins, and they were in the number three slot flying Old Faithful. Tucked off of Old Faithful at 7 o'clock was Lieutenant Warner and Carlson, with Captain Smith and Lieutenant Johnson in the second slot, and Jones and Steele holding the left flank in the third slot. Staff Sergeant Hull was focused and waiting for the sign to toggle. The rest of the crew were on high alert. The chatter on the inner phone was sporadic, since once they had crossed over into France, the damn thing kept going in and out, so there was no guarantee it was going to work when they needed it. Any second now, Hull thought. Come on, come on. They were aiming for the locks in the southwest corner of the pens. Let's jump up to the lead squadron real quick. Lieutenants Buddenbaum and Judas were flying the number two slot in the lead element, and their crew reported, Captain, we are directly over a six-gun flak unit. Then the barrels flashed. Captain Salada in 25180 commented to Lieutenant Kelly, If we make it back, would you remind me to tell the S-2 to seriously consider coming in from the water rather than land? Yes, sir. 
Over on the right side of the formation, Lieutenant Hennessy and the 19-year-old Little John. That's right, 19 years old and flying a B-17 in combat. And you may remember, he came from the Canadian Air Force, so he had had prior experience before finding his way onto a makeshift crew with Lieutenant Hennessy. This is also the crew that was given credit for being first over Germany. At least they had been told that. And here they were, running the gauntlet at Saint-Nazaire. The sky erupted as if hell itself had opened. The first explosions came in fierce unison, and the 306 bomb group was tossed back and forth by the Black Death, causing horrific turbulence. Jones called out, Report! Report! Is the intercom working? Again, the flak came crashing into the ships, and the nose of Jones and Steele's aircraft is drilled with flak as windscreens are shattered, and the aluminum tube does little to deflect the Black Death. Lieutenant Orman Hamilton goes down, hit in the neck. Another crash, and Staff Sergeant Hull is hit above the right eye, but it does not appear to be severe. Staff Sergeant Hull was dazed, but there was no rest for the weary, because they were in the bomb run, and the shelling continued. Lieutenant Hamilton was hit pretty badly and bleeding from the neck. Hull called for help, and Sergeant Bamforth was the closest, but it was Tech Sergeant Stymax that came to provide aid from his radio room. The first aid kit was under the navigator's table and was ripped open in the panic for supplies. On the other flank, little Audrey took a similar beating as the first eruption of flak sent Black Death through her nose, and Navigator First Lieutenant Casey Jones was missed twice when he moved both times to help Lieutenant Cole and Tony with the bombing run. Little Audrey's glass and windscreens were severely damaged in the initial attacks. Lieutenant Hennessy was calling out for reports while he and Lieutenant Little John were assessing the airworthiness of their aircraft. In the Deja Vu mission, I talk about how surprised the pilots and crews must have been when their aircraft exploded or they were hit by large shells. This is another one of those times that must have been quite startling for our heroes and Little Audrey. As Hennessy and Little John were getting reports and assessing the aircraft as it was thrown about by the flak, the windscreen in front of Lieutenant Little John flew out or off, whatever you want to say, and it hit him in the chest. He caught it and then used it to deflect the wind that was rushing into the cockpit. Imagine the shock and surprise. Imagine now trying to gather your poise, flying in formation, tight formation, at 150 miles an hour, at 20,000 feet, when it's minus 36 degrees, and the wind starts to hit you in the face. Now, imagine what it would be like if the remaining windows in the cockpit immediately iced over from the cold air. You were in the middle of a flak storm, in tight formation, on a bomb run, and now you can't see any other aircraft. Your nose is shot up. Your tail gunner, Staff Sergeant John Robinson Roller, a replacement who came in in January, is crawling for help because his oxygen line has been severed. You are flying on instruments, and your navigator is dodging flak. Imagine that. They were still in formation, assessing the damage, and trying to figure out what to do next. Flak Alley was living up to her name, and every aircraft was hit on the first barrage, and it was expert marksmanship, as the crews had come to expect. Some were hit worse than others. The flak was what the crews called heavy and intense. Get those bombs away, and with that, Lieutenant Frank Yalsey, the group bombardier, released the five 1,000-pound general-purpose bombs and called back to Colonel Putnam and Mac McKay. Bombs away. Captain Smith and Lieutenant Johnson in 24460, sitting outside of Steele's right side window, are hit by flak that tore through the nose in the bomb bay. Bombardier Lieutenant Stanley Kisberth, who was with Jones and Steele on that fateful day to Wilhelmshaven, is hit in the leg by flak, and it takes him off his sights as he starts to pour blood out of the wound. Lieutenant Eugene Pollock got to his friend and helped put a compress on it. Then they toggled the bombs. Toggled the bombs. I am. I am. But nothing happened. They toggled again, but nothing happened. The bomb rack had been damaged by flak. Tech Sergeant Harry Alleman, from his engineer position, went into the bomb bay and kicked 
the bombs out of the aircraft as the plane was tossed back and forth by the turbulence of the flak. Lieutenant Silos, flying the number three in the first element of the lead squadron, watched as their bombs took the hair off the fuselage of Lieutenant Urey and Hopkins in 714 Old Faithful. That was too damn close, Tech Sergeant Bloom commented. The Black Death was as bad as it ever had been, and the bombs from the aircraft above had just barely missed them. Many of you listening may have seen photos from World War II where the bombs from the aircraft in the high positions would sometimes strike and knock off wings, rudders, and stabilizers on the aircrafts below them. This is an example of a close call. Not only do you need to worry about the weather and the elements of high-altitude flying, flak, enemy aircraft, but now you have to worry about the bombs from the aircraft above you? Indeed, and coming soon, you'll have to worry about the machine guns from the aircraft in close formation trying to protect you. Staff Sergeant William Hull, like many other crews, was dealing with the chaos in the nose. He had a friend and crew member down with a flak wound to his neck, but he needed to toggle his five 1,000-pound bombs, and away they went. He watched as they leveled the buildings on both sides of the target, and then he turned back to help Stymax apply first aid to Hamilton, knowing he'd better hurry because the Luftwaffe were on their way. Tech Sergeant Stymax was able to get to Lieutenant Hamilton's wound and was able to get sulfur and a bandage on it. He gave Hamilton a shot of morphine and settled him in. All of this was while they were on oxygen and the flak continued to pierce the aluminum shell of the no-name deaf beauty. Jones asked for an update and the crew provided one. The crew was reporting flak holes throughout the ship and Jones could see the holes in the left wing. There was no further damage out of Steele's right side and the engines were in good order. The flak barrage continued. Steele was worried about his good friend, but he could not dwell on it because he had his hands full trying to fly the aircraft. Jones called again for status. Is the interphone working? What is going on? Luftwaffe Staffel 9, known as the Von Staffel, pilots and aircraft were at altitude and waiting for the 306 bomb group to come out of the bomb run, but really, they were waiting for the flak to stop. We have heard in other missions where some Luftwaffe pilots have braved the flak to get at the bombers during the bomb run, but the Von Staffel was not going to do that with the experienced flak crews of St. Nazaire, our old friend. Jones and Steele had a good view of Captain Salat and Lieutenant Kelly leading the 423rd, and they were bombs away, and they did not seem to be having any issues, but they were, as their top turret gun was out and Tech Sergeant Bloom could not get him to work, which was not a good omen for what was about to come. Lieutenant Ford, the bombardier and Lieutenant Check and Wigginton's aircraft, dropped about a thousand yards short, while Lieutenant Horner and Old Faithful also hit a little short. The Old Faithful had taken some serious flak damage, with both the number one and number two engines being hit. Off of Old Faithful's left tail flew Lieutenant Warner and Second Lieutenant Carlson, and they were also hit and had taken significant damage. Colonel Putnam took the 306 bomb group into a left bank, and the aircraft were headed towards Penente. Meanwhile, back on the Little Audrey, Lieutenant Hennessy and Little John were frozen, but they were stuck because if they tried to drop altitude and leave the formation, they would be easy prey for the Faka wolves who were waiting for them. So Little Audrey was still in formation, but they were unsure just how long they were going to be able to hold out. This is a pretty heavy burden for the pilot being responsible for the nine other crew members. The bomb group was leaving the heavy flat corridor and the Luftwaffe was in position to take over the attacks. Lieutenant Stato Stomberger and his von Ninth Staffel of JG-26 were waiting at 23,000 feet. His squadron was flying Faka Wolf 190s with their 230 caliber 8mm machine guns and four 20mm cannons. It was the best-in-class fighter at this time, but it did have some performance issues at higher altitudes. Lieutenant Stato had a couple of younger pilots in his squadron today, and the plan was to attack in groups on the nose of the bombers. Lieutenant Stato was comfortable with their position, so the attack began. Lieutenant Warner called out to the crew asking for a status, and the crew checked in with we're okay, even though there were some near misses. 
Second Lieutenant Carlson was reporting the number three and number four engines were having trouble. So he and Warner were trying to assess the extent of the damage. Tech Sergeant Claiborne Wilson, who was from North Carolina, he was the engineer, and he was in the top turret gun position, but he could not help with the engine performance because he had spotted a five-pack of Fokka Wolves lining up for an attack from one o'clock. He called it out. Every crew member was ready at their post. Captain, can you get the nose down, asked Wilson. He wanted to get his twin 50 caliber Browning machine guns at the right decreased elevation so that he may fight off the attack. Lieutenant Warner simply replied, okay. The ninth Stoffel, led by Lieutenant Stato, was focusing on the 423rd Squadron when they started their first attack from Lieutenant Warner's 1 o'clock, basically just outside of 2nd Lieutenant Carlson's window. It was just after 11 a.m., nearly 10 minutes after the bomb run. Captain Salata and Lieutenant Kelly in the DFC looked at each other as they noted 12 Faka Wolf 190s ramping up speed to press an attack on the 423rd Bomb Squadron. The 423rd Squadron gunners in all six ships went into action, trying to ward off the attack from the Fokka Wolf Stoffel. Tech Sergeant Wilson in the top turret of Lieutenant Warner's aircraft did not have enough negative elevation to fire at the Wolves. In the nose of the aircraft were Lieutenants Utley, the navigator from New York, and, and uh, Robert Kylis, the bombardier from Yanktown, uh, South Dakota. They were both manning their side nose machine guns, but neither had a good angle or view, which was the recurring problem we continue to discuss with the frontal nose attacks. Lieutenant Warner and Carlson called out the attacks as it commenced. Five of the Fokka Wolf 190s with guns and cannons ablaze attacked 425717, and they were deadly accurate this day on their first pass. Radio man Tech Sergeant Edward Espitalier was manning the Browning 50 caliber machine gun, but he could not see the attack as it was happening behind him. He could hear the machine guns belching a defense and hear the bullets hitting the aircraft. Then he could feel the attack as 20 millimeter cannon fragments struck him in the hip and leg, severely wounding him and throwing him to the floor of the B-17. It was fragments because a 20 millimeter cannon striking him in whole would have resulted in certain death. Tech Sergeant Espitalier lay on the floor with his back against the radio door, trying to apply a tourniquet and first aid to his left leg. The ball turret gunner Walter Morgan and waist gunners Staff Sergeant Robert Kisling and Sergeant Colin Neely tried to pick up the Fokka Wolf Pack as they buzzed by, but they too were raked with gunfire as the attackers delivered their deadly ordnance. The aircraft then made a sudden and rapid nosedive to the right. Lieutenants Raymond Check and Bart Wigginton had to take immediate evasive action to ensure that they did not collide with Lieutenant Warner's aircraft. On the first Stoffel 9 pass, the 425717 was hit hard. Steel shrapnel ricocheted through the cockpit. The pilots flinched, and the aircraft lurched into a right bank nosedive. Second Lieutenant Carlson was trying to get his wits about him, and the smoke in the cockpit was adding to the confusion. Captain! Captain! Carlson was calling out. He could see Warner slumped over the controls, bleeding profusely from the back of his head. He was still moving, but he was seriously wounded. Second Lieutenant Carlson was on the interphone, screaming for help, but the interphone in the front of the aircraft had been shot out, and there was no reply. Lieutenant Warner was a big man, and he was jammed up against the controls. Second Lieutenant Carlson could not get him off. Lieutenant Warner was still barely alive. Lieutenant Carlson continued struggling to get Warner off of the controls and out of the pilot's seat as the aircraft plunged towards the earth. Lieutenant Carlson was desperate to keep the plane from spinning or rolling over. Carlson was finally able to get Warner out of the left seat and the aircraft continued to dive for the clouds. Tech Sergeant Wilson could now see Lieutenant Warner standing, stooped over in the catwalk with a serious head wound to the back of his head. 425717 was now separated from the pack and in great peril as she continued to dive for the clouds. The number four engine was smoking and Lieutenant Carlson was trying to keep the aircraft under control, the best one pilot could do. 
The Faka wolves had separated their prey from the herd, and now it was just a matter of time. Unter officer Eric Schwartz and Lieutenant Stato led the second pass on the no name deaf beauty, and it was just as lethal as the first. As Tech Sergeant Wilson was trying to fire the top turret gun, the Faka wolf cannon fire knocked it off, and the oxygen tanks flew through the aircraft, hitting Lieutenant Warner, who laid in the catwalk dying if he was not already dead. 425717 was getting shot to pieces, literally. A sixth Faka wolf had joined the hunt and they took turns making passes at the bomber. Bombardier Lieutenant Kylis made his way to the cockpit and could see Lieutenant Warner dead in the catwalk. Second Lieutenant Carlson needed help. He was trying to dive into a cloud bank at 6,000 feet. He made it but it was short-lived. Lieutenant Kylas could hear Lieutenant Utley on the nose gun when the 425717 was once again blasted by cannon fire. The number three engine was on fire and it was engulfing the wing. The fire extinguishers were not working. The fuel in the wing could explode at any second. They were now under 6,000 feet and rapidly descending. With an engine on fire, the bailout signal was given. Tech Sergeant Wilson was trying to get to the back of the aircraft to provide assistance to the other crew members. Staff Sergeant Morgan was in the ball turret, and the ball turret was severely damaged. Morgan could not get out. He knew he would be going down with the ship, and that would be his fate. Wilson was trying to get Espitalier out of the radio room, but Eddie was laying against the door. Claiborne was finally able to get the door open, and Espitalier, heavily bandaged and slow of foot, followed Wilson towards the rear escape hatch. The back of the aircraft was decimated, and the crew were in dire straits. Colin Neely was lying next to his waist gun dead. He did not want to go on this mission and had reservations about it, but after discussing it with the bomb group surgeons, he was convinced to go. Staff Sergeant Robert Kisling, originally from Ohio, was mortally wounded and also lying in the fuselage of the rapidly descending aircraft but it was still under control. The tail gunner, our friend, William Williams from Florida, no relations, was also dead. He had been killed in one of the Stoffel 9 attacks. Wilson was able to get to the waste gunner hatch and kick it open, where he and Espitalier were able to escape the aircraft. As Wilson was falling, he could see that Eddie had made it out and saw another chute with no occupant. The harness had apparently failed or had been shot off. Maybe... It was Sergeant Kissling's shoot. It was hard to tell. Meanwhile, in the front of the aircraft, Carlson was trying his best to maintain some control over the aircraft. The number three engine was burning, and there was not much time. They needed to get out before the aircraft exploded. Lieutenant Stato and Eric Schwartz came around again, followed by their posse, and they made one final pass to finish the job. Lieutenant Kylis had made his way to the nose hatch, and Carlson told him to get out of the aircraft, but he got hung up on the hatch. But it is believed that Carlson shoved him out of the hatch just when the nose of the aircraft was once again shredded by cannon fire and exploded. Kylius flew from the aircraft and pulled his chute as he started to drift towards the earth. One of the Stoffel 9 pilots circled him, waved, then hurried off. As for Carlson, well, there is still some debate and mystery surrounding what happened to Steele's co-pilot. Lieutenant Lewis Utley from New York was in the nose of the aircraft firing his machine gun as Lieutenant Kylius went out the hatch escape. Then, the nose was further decimated by cannon fire and exploded. Lieutenant Kylius noted Lieutenant Utley is dead in his evade report, but listed Carlson as unknown status. It is not completely clear when Lieutenant Utley was killed, but it was most likely at his gun and while Kylius was thrown from the aircraft. Wilson and Eddie were also circled by the Luftwaffe pilots, but had no incidents with them. Wilson watched as 425717 neared the earth, and he knew Sergeant Morgan was still in the ball turret, and he was hoping for some additional shoots, but there were none, and the 425717 crashed into the earth and disintegrated. Wilson and Kylius both would hit the ground running and became evadees, both ending up back in England after a couple of months, and therefore they were able to contribute to the story. Tech Sergeant Eddie Espitalier, he had visions of invading, 
but his wounds were too great, and he was captured and sent to a German hospital for six weeks, before ending up in the infamous Luftstalag III. The 425717 crashed in the area of Gila, just west of Plamel, which is about 40 nautical miles north of St. Nazaire. This was a tremendous loss to the 423rd Bomb Squadron. The last steel Jones and the rest of the 423rd Squadron saw Lieutenant Warner and his aircraft and crew was when they were flying into the cloud bank at 6,000 feet. Lieutenant Warner's crew would be listed as MIA and families would be informed that their loved ones were missing in action with unknown fate. The missing air crew report is 15472 if you are interested in looking it up. Lieutenant Warner was a fine young man and was Steele's mentor on the first mission to Romilly Susain. If you like or believe in numerology, it is interesting to note that Lieutenant William Warner is buried in Plot 1, Row 11, Grave 11, 11, 11, at the Brittany American Cemetery. The other crew members that Steele flew with that day were Eddie S. Battalier, Claiborne Wilson, Walter Morgan, Colin Neely, and Robert Kissling another set of crew members whose bunks will be vacant. Steele was also saddened that his good friend and co-pilot, Arnold Carlson, was missing. They never got to fly a mission together in Europe, and they had arrived with such a spree de corps. But now Steele was starting to think. A lot. Let's now jump back to the simultaneous action that is happening in our story. Steele, Jones, and the crew of the no-named F Beauty 42 5171 prepared for the Luftwaffe Staffel 9 attack that they could see was coming. Sergeant Hull was fixed to a jury rigged twin 50 caliber Browning machine gun in the nose that afforded them a little more protection. Tech Sergeant Leon Bamforth was in the top turret gun position, calling out the enemy wolf pack positions. The problem was the inner phone was not working properly. Lieutenant Hamilton was bandaged and lying in the nose. Sergeant Stymax was on his radio gun with Sergeant Walter Piotrowski in his usual ball turret position. The newest crew members were on the waist gun, and that was Sergeant Charles Sheffield and Sergeant Abraham Cogen. They were both trying their luck as waist gunners today. Talk about your baptisms of fire. Then, bringing up the rear is our favorite and ever-reliable tail gunner, Sergeant James Smoot. The contrails stacked up, and with a rush, the Luftwaffe Staffel made their attack. Steele and Jones piloted and evaded where they could and watched as Lieutenant Warner was hit and his aircraft went into a sharp dive, as we earlier heard. The Fokker Wolf pilots carried their attacks through, and 425171 is blistered with machine gun and cannon fire. Jones calls out for a status. The controls are loose. What is going on? The gunners have no time to evaluate the damage. They are trying to fight off the Luftwaffe attacks, and was also doing their best to keep the Nazis off of Lieutenant Warner. Staff Sergeant Ray J. Smith, flying as the right waist gunner for Captain Smith in 24460, picked up a Focke Wolf 190 flying level at 21,500 feet as it made an attack from 3 o'clock on Lieutenant Warner's aircraft. Sergeant Ray J. picked up the yellow nose bastard at 500 yards and started firing, hitting it at 300 yards. The Focke Wolf then peeled off at 150 yards in intense flames and headed for the deck. I hope we get more from Ray J. Smith from Pennsylvania as I love the name and he joined the Army Air Corps on my brother's birthday, July 11, 1940. With a name like Ray J., I was expecting someone a little more Southern if you get what I'm throwing down, but I guess it's a great name no matter where you're from. For the next hour, the squadron was under constant attack from the Luftwaffe inland fighters, and then they would get passed off to another squadron that would chase them into the channel. Here they come. Sergeants Hull and Bamforth were calling out the attack. Jones and Steele had a front row seat, and they were the targets. How is it possible that Lieutenant Hennessy and Lieutenant Littlejohn were still airborne, flying at altitude, 
without a windscreen at minus 36 degrees. Just after the attacks on the 423rd Squadron had started on the left wing, a squadron had also attacked the right wing, picking on the flank and little Audrey. As the Luftwaffe Staffels started their attacks, four Fokka Wolfs from JG-26 came in at 11 o'clock high and dove on Little Audrey. Lieutenant Jones and Colin Tony had a great view in the Holy Nose, and Tech Sergeant Wiley was able to get his top turret gun into position. What happens next happens over the next five minutes in three successive attacks on Captain Riordan's 369th Squadron. Little Audrey, Lieutenant Malazuski and Watson in 25404 Giesel, and Lieutenant McGoffin and Lieutenant Vintage in 488 Banshee. The Fokka Wolf Pack was not deterred by the tracers, and they made continuous attacks on the bombers. Lieutenant Charles F. Jones, navigator on the Little Audrey, who had been dodging flak, was now manning the left nose gun as the wolf pack made their run, sending 20mm cannon and 8mm machine gun fire towards the little Audrey. Lieutenant Jones exchanged fire with the Fokka wolf, standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, sweating, and then hitting the enemy at 200 yards and pouring it into her with a win at 100 yards. The Fokka wolf disintegrated and flamed out that made everyone flinch. Lieutenant Little John had a quick thought. What if something comes through the windshield? The next pass, two minutes later, had the little Audrey in full defense. This time, a group of three wolves came in at two o'clock low, and the bombardier, Lieutenant Colantoni, did not wait. He started firing the Browning 50 caliber machine gun at 600 yards and stayed on the target until at 400 yards, the Fokka wolf went into a steep dive and never came out of it. Just like that, Little Audrey had knocked down two enemy aircraft, but there was no rest for the weary as the third Luftwaffe attack had commenced. Lieutenant Little John continued to hold the windscreen and help fly the aircraft as Lieutenant Hennessy tried to evade without crashing into another aircraft. This time, the deadly attack by four Fokka Wolves was 12 o'clock level, straight at the pilots, and Lieutenant Colantoni's dilemma was targeting as in, which one of these bastards does he shoot at? The bombardier also got some hits on a selected Fokka wolf at 300 yards and put more into her when at 100 yards she started to flame out and the aircraft went into a glide and you knew the pilot had been killed as the aircraft pitched for the earth. The little Audrey had no business being in the air, let alone in a dogfight, and now she had a hat trick of kills. The next pair of Fokka Wolves climbed at a rapid rate to meet their adversaries and ramped up engine speed as they did. They had their eyes on the Banshee. The Banshee, according to her pilots, were off of Giesel's right wing when they accepted the Fokka Wolf attack from 2 o'clock low. When at 600 yards, Browning 50 caliber tracers were seen going into the fuselage of one of the Fokka Wolves. When she then rolled over, erupted into flames, and kept diving for the clouds. At the defense was the bombardier, 2nd Lieutenant Clyde J. Travis, who had come in with the rest of the crew as a replacement in mid-January. Lieutenant Jones's mind was abuzz. They were in a tight spot, and he continued to ask for battle damage reports, which of course had to come in between Luftwaffe attacks. The interphone continued to only work part of the time, and now that they were taking battle damage, it may be totally knocked out. Staff Sergeant Smoot, from his tail gun position, was rattled. The tail had been shot up worse than the nose. His guns were still working, and he was okay. Tech Sergeant Bamforth, from his top turret, could see part of the damage. Captain, I can see the damage on the vertical stabilizer, sir. A message came in from Sergeant Kojin at the waste gun, reporting that four feet of the horizontal stabilizer was missing and shot to hell. The controls of the aircraft were not tight, and she had lost responsiveness. Jones and Steele knew they were going to have to keep her in close formation, but at the same time, keeping her close meant that there was a danger of collision. When the bomb group had passed through Flack Alley, Captain Ryan and Major Oliver were leading the clay pigeons in Sweet Pea. 
when Lieutenant Joseph Downing and Lieutenant Howard Kelly's aircraft, 425175, a no-named F-beauty, was hit hard at the target area by flak. It sounded like hail hitting a metal roof, the sound of flak tearing through a B-17F at 23,000 feet. The number one engine was hit and started smoking. Then it started to vibrate like a blender gone wild. Shut her down, demanded Lieutenant Downing, and Lieutenant Kelly shut her down. Downing flipped the battery off and Kelly feathered the engine. It sounded like hail hitting a metal roof. Did I say that already? The number three engine was now gone. The pilots followed the same routine and shut her down. The bomb group was banking away from the target and they tried to keep up, but they could not. Staff Sergeant Robinson, from his engineer position, was assessing the engines, and with two engines gone, the last two may burn up. Dire straits indeed, but they needed more power, and they needed to stay as close as possible to the formation. But a feathered engine was like blood in the water. Lieutenants Parker and Fortin in 425072 could see that 425175 needed help. So they broke rank and tried to stay with her, trying to give her some additional protection. It is courageous to fall out of formation to protect a friend. The Faka Wolves were on the scent, and it was Lieutenant Stato and the Ninth Stoffel, with Feldwebel Franz Dorr by Stato's side. Captain Ryan and Major Oliver and Sweet Pea called out the attack at 12 o'clock level and the blue and silver and all-black Focke Wolf 190s tore through the Sweet Pea and Ryan's element. 20mm cannon shells found Lieutenant Downing's fourth engine, and out it went. Staff Sergeant George Peterson, at his right waist gun position of the Sweet Pea, was trying to hold the Focke Wolves off, but he could not. Lieutenant Downing and Kelly feathered the third engine, and Downing put the aircraft into a steep dive. They were trying to get to the clouds at 6,000 feet in a deja vu scene same as Lieutenant Warner and Carlson. The prey had been separated and the hounds were after the fox. There was nothing else Lieutenant Parker and Fortin could do, so they quickly rejoined the Sweet Pea and the rest of the formation, and their crew was calling on the interphone, Bail out! Bail out! Try to keep those fighters off them, boys! Downing and Kelly were racing for the clouds, but the Focke Wolves were faster. There's a strong historical chance that it was Feldwebel Franz Dorr that put the coup de grace into 425175 as she dove for the clouds. The cannons ripped through the midsection of the ship, and Staff Sergeant Harvey Ross never knew what hit him, killing him instantly. Staff Sergeant George Green from Kansas was trying to aid Ross, but there was nothing he could do. At 6,000 feet, Lieutenant Downing was able to get into a cloud bank, and the bailout alarm sounded, and the crew started to bail out. Lieutenant Howard Pratt and Lieutenant George Bryan went out the nose hatch. There were two Greens on the aircraft, Royal Green from Texas and George Green from Kansas. No relation, because that would have been crazy, and out they went. Also trying to get out of the aircraft were Staff Sergeant Henry Jones on the radio, Staff Sergeant Loris Elliott as the tail gunner, and Staff Sergeant Alan Robinson, the engineer. Downing and Kelly were the last to get out of the aircraft as she then headed for the earth. I love it when the pilots and crews of the 306 bomb group identify the colors and schemes of the Luftwaffe aircraft. Today's mission has one of those notes documented. Captain Riordan and his crew in the Wahoo 2 noted blue and silver Focke Wolf 190s along with some all black Focke Wolf 190s. The 306 bomb group was now under constant attacks from the Luftwaffe. They were passing Plomon and headed for Gangon, and they were dropping altitude as they went. They were crossing over the Brest Peninsula which seems like a pretty bad idea to me. Back on the left flank, the 423rd Squadron had more than 10 attacks on their position, with some attacks containing up to 12 Focke Wolfs, who would then pass the attack off to the aircraft behind them. Sergeant Hull, from his twin nose gun position, was bleeding above the eye, 
but he was not bad enough to stop fighting. Here they come again, 11 o'clock level. Slightly below, he calls out over the interphone, wondering if anyone is picking up the message. Tech Sergeant Bamforth from his engineer position feels helpless as he can't get his guns on them due to the elevation. Jones and Steele, with Captain Smith and Lieutenant Johnson by their side, move up on Lieutenant Urey and Lieutenant Hopkins now that Warner was down, trying to tighten the group up. The Faka Wolves came screaming through, and Steele could hear the bullets hitting the no-named F-Beauty as she took more damage through the center of the aircraft. The aircraft was shaking from all of the defensive fire, seemingly erupting at once. Our friend, Walter Piotrowski, tried to hold them off, but the Faka Wolves ignored the tracers as they came whizzing by. Waste gunners, Sheffield and Cogen, also tried their luck, and Staff Sergeant James Smoot would get a burst on them as they passed by the rear of the aircraft, but he, too, was having trouble getting a fix on the enemy aircraft. Lieutenant Jones once again asked the crew for a status check. They were shaken, but unharmed, and Lieutenant Hamilton was stable. They were not going to have to throw him out of the aircraft, yet. Captain, as reported, the vertical stabilizer has a large cannon hole in it, and Steele was reporting it looks like we may have a flat tire. Captain, the sons of bitches are coming again, and it was deja vu as the Faka Wolves made another pass at 12 o'clock a little below. The 50 calibers were not quite singing because the ammunition was poor, so the gunners were having to clear jams, which takes a gunner off of the target and puts one in a bad spot. The crew could hear the bullets hitting the ship. The damage was not significant, so the only reports were on how the ammunition was crap. It was hard enough putting up a defense, but when the ammunition is poor, well, that just adds to the suffering. There is no reason we can't get high-quality ammunition. Steele could see Captain Smith out his right window, and he looked okay. There was no obvious damage, and their no-name Deaf Beauty's engines were running well. They moved up on the Old Faithful now that Warner was down. Old Faithful had obvious battle damage to her engines, but she was still in formation. Captain Check and Lieutenant Wigington and their no-named F-Beauty also had battle damage, while Captain Salada and Lieutenant Kelly had taken the least amount of damage, only holes from the flak, and none of it in critical organs. In the geography between Raiden and the channel, Lieutenants Parker and Fortin, sitting behind the beloved Sweet Pea on the right side of the formation, were putting on the most heroic of defenses. They had witnessed the downing of Lieutenant Downing and Kelly out their right window. The 425072 had not suffered any catastrophic battle damage, but they were having significant mechanical issues with the number one and number two engines, both on the left side of the aircraft. The number one engine was vibrating and shaking very badly, and the number two engine had the supercharger running away. Four Faka Wolf 190s attacked from three o'clock low. Staff Sergeant James S. Clark and Staff Sergeant George Peterson opened fire on the wolf pack. Peterson was able to single a Faka Wolf out, striking her when she made several fast snap rolls and started smoking in rich black smoke and disappeared into the clouds. Then a lone wolf tried her luck on the 425072. The Luftwaffe pilot in his Faka Wolf 190 started his attack from 11 o'clock level, firing his guns and then banked to the right, going under the aircraft at a 7 o'clock. Staff Sergeant James Clark in his ball turret position unloaded a burst into her, and you could see the tracers hitting the aircraft. It continued to race away when at 700 yards, tail gunner L.H. O'Brien did not need to add any further ado because she burst into flames and fell in a low spin. The no-named F-Beauty continued to drop altitude with the rest of the bomb group when another lone Faka Wolf attacked from 6 o'clock low, but he was attacking another bomb group behind and above the 306 Squadron. This time, the radio operator, Staff Sergeant Richard Hafe, 
was able to get a burst into the belly of the Faka wolf, gutting her like she was some sort of prey, and she rolled over, then started a violent spin, never to be seen again. Captain Ryan and Major Oliver knew things were getting tight. Tight means dangerous, and the attacks by the Luftwaffe pilots were very effective. Ryan could see the Faka wolf staging due to the stiffening contrails, as could Lieutenant Robert Herman, the navigator, and Lieutenant James Lane, the bombardier. The guns on the sweet pea erupted. The Faka wolf did not deter and placed a 20 millimeter cannon shell in the cockpit. The shell lit one of the flares, you know, the ones that signal there is a wounded crew member on board when they get back to base. Captain Ryan lost control of the ship as his steering column had been severed by the 20 millimeter cannon. Captain Ryan tells Major Oliver that the Major has the ship and he has no steering. The flare bounces through the cockpit and sets Major Oliver's cap and hair on fire. If Captain Ryan and Major Oliver thought things were tight a second ago, they were certainly tighter now. There was smoke throughout the cockpit. Ryan had no controls. Oliver's hat was on fire. They were fully masked due to the oxygen. Ryan and engineer Arthur Bodoin quickly worked to extinguish the flames, but not before Major Oliver was severely burned. Oliver stayed on the controls during the blaze, which is a testament to his skill. Smoke continued to fill the cockpit. There was only one set of controls to fly the ship. Oliver was in significant pain, so there were concerns he may pass out. This day, like many others, was turning into what the pilots and crews called a running battle. The hours of tight formation manual flying with aircraft that had taken battle and mechanical damage was stressful. There's no better example of this than what was going on on the Little Audrey. Lieutenants Hennessy, Little John, and the crew still had her airworthy, and the dropping of altitude in formation was a welcome relief to them as they were frozen, I mean literally frozen, and to endure such pain during the stress of combat is really quite remarkable. And remember, Lieutenant Little John is just 19 years old and partly responsible for a $500,000 machine and nine other crew members. The Luftwaffe's 9th Staffel had used their ammunition and fuel and passed the bomb group to other squadrons in Brest and central France. We know how good the Brest pilots are, and the 306 is running the gauntlet with a bunch of shot-up aircraft. The running battle would continue into the English Channel with the question of, where are the Spitfires? The 306 continued to drop altitude and were heading over the English Channel at 8,000 feet. There were some 40 enemy aircraft still in pursuit, but they were now primarily focused on the trailing bomb groups. Colonel Putnam and Captain McKay were in the catbird seat today, and they did not have any critical damage or wounded airmen. Lieutenant Buddenbaum and Lieutenant Judas in 41-24467, the Grim Reaper, was headed home on three engines and no crew injuries. Outside of Lieutenant Buddenbaum's left window sat Lieutenant Silos and Lieutenant Kramarinko in Montana Power, 41-24465, two brother aircraft that came off the assembly line, one aircraft apart. The Montana Power had a few small holes, but had dodged the damage from the Faka Wolves. In the trailing element of the lead squadron, both Captain Reagan and Lieutenant Bucky had to abort and had turned back before originally crossing the English Channel on the way out. That left Lieutenant Friend and Lieutenant Kudback in 129, who have a bunch of holes but nothing that is impacting their aircraft. However, Lieutenant Smiley in 41-24466, a no-name deaf beauty, has an engine out and a hole in the number two fuel tank. Captain Ryan and Major Oliver and Sweet P 425130 have the pilot control shot out, and Oliver is severely burned. The Sweet P is severely shot up, but they are still leading the second squadron. Lieutenant Parker and Fortin in 425072, a no-name deaf beauty, they have an engine down, a supercharger out, 
but this crew put up the most gallant of defenses, as we heard earlier in the show. The second element of the second squadron was led by Captain Riordan and Lieutenant Edris in 425086, one of our favorite aircraft, the Wahoo 2, who was in good order and their crew would ultimately report a good show. Off the right wing of the Wahoo 2 sat the Giesel, 425404, with Lieutenant Malazuski and Lieutenant Watson. They had incurred several attacks on the day, and they had sustained damaged props, trim tabs, and the horizontal stabilizer had been shot up. In the number three spot is the infamous Banshee II, who was argued as first over Germany, flown by a relatively new pilot for our story, Lieutenant McGoffin, and Second Lieutenant Vintage. They were coming home without a hydraulic system, as it had been shot up in one of the early Focke Wolf attacks. That brings us to the last plane in the element and the tail of the dog on the right flank today, 41-2560 Little Audrey, with Lieutenant Hennessy and Little John, our 19-year-old windscreen-holding co-pilot. The drop in altitude helped with the cold, but there was still a rush of air coming through the aircraft. They'd been shot up good, but the Germans had not been able to knock out any of their other mechanicals or controls. Moving over to the 3rd Squadron in the left flank of the bomb group, Captain Salata and Lieutenant Kelly were in the DFC, 425180. The first aircraft Steele flew when he arrived in Thirdly, with Lieutenant Warner in the captain's seat. That was the last thing on Steele's mind today. It was just an afterthought as the years faded by. The DFC had a few small holes punched through her, but they did not strike any vitals or any crew members. Lieutenant Check and Lieutenant Bart Wigginton were in their no-named F beauty, 425720. They were making it home with a shot-up nose, three engines, and a shredded elevator. They had also had their number two engine without its supercharger, and the number three engine's prop started to run away. When they finally made it home, they were quick to point out, it was hell. Old Faithful were limping home with Lieutenant Yuri and Lieutenant Hopkins in the cockpit, and Tech Sergeant Roscovich on the wireless. Both of the engines on the left side had been hit, and their rudder cable had been shot away. They were thankful that the other groups were now under pressure, since they had lost a waste gun and a ball turret gun during the previous scraps. Captain Smith and Lieutenant Johnson were in the no-name deaf beauty outside of Steele's window, 4124460. Their bombardier, Lieutenant Kisberth, was wounded, and they would get one of the priority landing spots when they approached Thurley. Their hydraulics were shot out, and they were full of holes, both to their aircraft and their crew. Lastly, Jones and Steele in 425171, the other aircraft to challenge being first over Germany, they were not in good shape. Lieutenant Hamilton was stable, but needed treatment fast. Staff Sergeant Hall was also wounded, but just needed to be cleaned up. The no-name deaf beauty was missing four feet of the horizontal stabilizer. The vertical stabilizer was as holy as Swiss cheese. The nose was shot up, and they were going to be landing with a flat tire, which with the B-17F made for a nervous landing. As the 306th came into Thurley, the ground crews counted the aircraft, but there were two missing. The three aircraft with wounded personnel set off flares and proceeded to land first. The B-17F was not an overly difficult plane to fly, but it did require a good touch when it came to landing, and it was a checklist plane, meaning you needed to go through the checklist to ensure proper procedure. The long manual flights added to the fatigue, and the shot-up stabilizers, rudders, and hydraulics did not help. The B-17 required a three-point touchdown, and sometimes, on wet, grassy runways, there was trouble. Today, Jones and Steele brought the battle-damaged 425171 in and landed her safely, with a flat tire and two wounded crew members. The crew was very complimentary of the pilots for bringing the damaged plane back successfully. Captain Smith and Lieutenant Johnson would land with the, with the wounded Lieutenant Kisberth sitting in the nose. 
Captain Ryan and the Sweet Pea would come in really with Major Oliver on the controls and being the wounded crew member. Lieutenant Hennessy and Little John brought back an aircraft without a windshield, which immediately captured the eye of an aspiring young reporter, Andy Rooney, who had found favor with the 306 bomb group. Waiting for the crews were the reporters, and on this day, the great Andy Rooney was there. He was not great yet, but ultimately would be great, like a fine wine with time. Rooney grabbed Hennessy, Little John, and the Little Audrey, thinking he had a story to share, and that he did. There's also a good chance that Walter Cronkite was there too, but I cannot find a reference for him on this day. Dr. Thurman Schiller and his medical team were there to care for the wounded, the burned, and the frostbitten. This included the 423rd surgeon, Dr. Samuel Simpson, and his staff, who jumped in the aircraft to assess Lieutenants Hamilton and Kisberth. They got them both out of the aircraft and into the hospital. Steele watched as his friend Lieutenant Orman Hamilton was taken away. He also saw Staff Sergeant Hull being treated, and then word came back that it was Lieutenant Kisberth who was down in Captain Smith's aircraft, and Steele thought, not another friend. The 306 Bomb Group's old friend at St. Nazaire continued to be their nemesis. The next morning, the bomb group would be praised for their bombing, and they would be shown photos of the damage that they had inflicted, and it would be classified as a successful raid and well worth it. The photos in the mission report were provided by 412561, the younger sister of Little Audrey, who was assigned to the 359th, 303rd Bomb Group. I will call out that this aircraft will have a Medal of Honor recipient posthumously awarded for a mission on March 18, 1943, which is about a month away. The Luftwaffe and JG-26, well, they would report just the opposite, and that the submarine pins were completely missed by all the bombers. Funny. I guess when I read the after-action reports, both sides are wrong, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. But was it worth it? That was what the pilots and crews of the 306 bomb group were wondering. That sentiment was also shared by high-ranking officials in Washington, D.C. But the 8th Air Force High Command was going to press forward with maximum effort missions to prove the sacrifice was worth it. But was it worth it? Lieutenant Downing and Kelly were replacements. And it was harder for the replacements to fit in, but the fact was there were fewer and fewer veterans to fit in with. Lieutenant Downing had come in at the end of December. Lieutenant Kelly had come in on the 11th, the same day as Steele. Lieutenant Howard Pratt, the navigator, came in the same day with Kelly and Steele. Lieutenant George Bryan, well, he was new. In fact, the combat diary says he arrived the day he was lost. February 16, 1943. Wouldn't that be crazy? Staff Sergeant Harvey Ross, the waste gunner who was killed, well, he'd flown with Colonel Armstrong on the first mission to Germany. The Downing crew overall was pretty new, and it certainly was their first mission together. The loss of Lieutenant Warner and his crew was a little different. Lieutenant Warner was an experienced, tenured pilot, one of the veterans, who had been with the unit since inception and helped to bring it over to England. His crew was well-seasoned. Lieutenant Warner had been around long enough that everybody knew and respected him. Dr. Schiller's diary provides us with more insight into the morale and psyche of these airmen. He comments how it is better to be lost as an MIA than lying on a slab in the morgue. He said when crews are MIA, the other crews always have hope, but when they're laying in the morgue, they're devastated, so it is better to have hope. But what about the families? I suppose hope is always better. For 2nd Lieutenant David A. Steele, February 16, 1943, was a very bad day. The crew he flew with on his first mission, December 12, 1942, to run, was missing in action. Their pilot was a good man, a good teacher, and an even better human being. 
His good friend and 23-year-old co-pilot from Washington State, Arnold Carlson, he watched go down with Warner right in front of his eyes. His best friend and navigator, Orman Hamilton, was now in surgery with a wound to his neck. His gunner and friend, William Hall, was wounded. Seal thought back to his first mission and repeated his words, What have I gotten myself into? A few months later, more information on Lieutenant Warner's aircraft would surface, both from Lieutenant Kylius and Tech Sergeant Wilson, who had evaded capture and returned to England, but also from an English agent planted in France. In the English agent's account, Second Lieutenant Arnold Carlson, the young first-generation Swedish immigrant, was also considered an evadee. No one ever saw him leave the aircraft, so it's always been assumed he went down with the ship. Maybe he was thrown from the aircraft when Lieutenant Kylis was going out, or maybe even killed in that attack. However, it is an interesting angle that he was an evadee. The English agent reported the crew that were killed were buried by the Germans in a mass grave and given a funeral to pay last respects. After the Germans left, the French held a service of their own, and later they brought a large amount of flowers, even though it was in the middle of winter. The French continued to bring fresh flowers to the graves every Sunday since. How cool is that? It completely aligned with my own personal experiences with the French, who pay homage to those who were fighting to liberate them from tyranny. William Uncle Bill Warner, the insurance salesman from Connecticut, would make captain posthumously. In starting my research on my uncle, I knew this mission was coming. My uncle had shared stories about his co-pilot being killed with another crew, so when I started that research, I saw that it was with Warner and that Warner had taken Steele out on his first mission. Research suggested Captain Warner was a fine young man and was another victim of the senseless loss of World War II. I highly encourage you to look him up. One look at his smile, now that you know his character, will make you sad, and you will, you will be able to feel the pain 80 years later. This wraps up the episode Uncle Bill in the February 16, 1943 trip to St. Nazaire. The next mission will take us to March 13, 1943, where the Meat Hound makes her maiden voyage with Lieutenant David A. Steele in the captain's chair. But before we get there, we have to crash first, so please stay tuned. I would also like to report that I am meeting family members whose relatives flew with my uncle, and they are providing me with research and information that they have in their possession. Specifically, thank you, Sean. Just think of the things you may find when you are looking for something else. Gaspar, out. <laughs>